Hello. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, yet again, so it's my great pleasure to introduce Kyle Kramer today. Um, we just have to spend a couple of more seconds until the um, YouTube video stream goes online. Maybe uh, until this happens, I can also give you already give you a bit of introduction to the tools that you have here in, in the Crowdcast um, portal. So if you want to ask a question about the talk, I would like to ask you to already type your question in there at the, at the right bottom. You find a button that says ask a question. And whenever you have a scientific question, you can type your question there. And you can also try to monitor the questions a bit because you can upvote or downvote the questions. Um, and then in the end, um, we are going to ask some of these questions to our speaker, um, the, the ones that have the most, got the most votes. Okay. Um, other than that, we have the chat. And in the chat, you can simply type nice remarks if you want or also report technical problems. And then we're going to take, uh, take care of them. Okay. I'm just waiting for our signal that we are ready for for the YouTube um, channel as well. Let me just see what my colleagues say. <laughs> They're not going to wave. OK, so I think we just um, get started. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Kyle Kramer today, who is a professor for physics and data science at New York University. Um, he got his um, Bachelor of Science um, many years ago already in physics and mathematics. And then in 2005, um, did his PhD in physics. He received a number of awards, for example, an early career award for scientists and engineers um, or an NSF um, career award. And what is interesting for us is that he's working right at the intersection between physics and machine learning. And in, fr from the physical side, he's interested in the discovery of, of new particles and works at Large Hadron Colliders, um, but using lots of tools that one could also um, call machine learning tools, namely using like generative models um, for, to model the physical phenomena that occur, um, looking at um, intractable likelihood, robustness, uncertainties, um, reproducible workflows, all these kind of keywords that, we, that are also important for our cluster. And for this reason, I'm very, very happy that we have Kyle Kramer here giving his presentation today. So Kyle, um, I hope, um, looking forward to your presentation, um, you can start now. I don't know how it works technically, but I think you just start talking and then we see what's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Well, if there's a problem, please interrupt me. But uh, thank you very much for the nice introduction. And uh, it's really a pleasure to uh, join you. I'm uh, envious of your cluster. It looks uh, very impressive. I like the kind of mix of uh, interdisciplinary topics. Uh, it's certainly been something that I've been enjoying recently. Um, so I tried to, uh, you know, aim this talk uh, in, a, in a very interdisciplinary way. I'll have some examples from physics, but I'm going to try to use uh, language and uh, that's uh, sort of universal. And uh, and I thought I would talk about how we can use machine learning to try to get the most out of our highest fidelity physical models. I think it's one of the ways, one of the clearest ways where machine learning and science uh, can come together. Um, so this has been work that I've been doing in the last few years with a you know, really diverse group of computer scientists and physicists and other types of uh, physical, you know, mainly the physical sciences. Um, and uh, and so I'll be highlighting some of the work from the various uh, collaborators here on the slide, and I'm not, not able to include photos for everyone. Um, <clears throat> and so I'm going to start with uh, basically just this kind of setting the stage with a, uh, a reminder of the types of simulators that we see in science uh, from link scales all the way from the very small, like you see at, at particle colliders, to the very, very large, like you see in the evolution of the universe. And of course, lots of uh, things in the middle, which are more related to our everyday experience, like uh, epidemics and uh, airplanes and uh, molecular dynamics for protein folding. And as we'll hear from uh, Jacob Mackey later uh, today uh, about uh, uh, neuroscience and neuronal activity. Um, and the, the thing that I would like to say about simulators, which is maybe, maybe obvious, but maybe not so obvious, is that you can use them to generate, you know, uh, synthetic data, which is which is more clear. But they're also they represent causal generative models of the data generating process, um, and that causality is is related to the fact that the simulators usually are based on some sort of low level mechanistic model for what's going on. Um, and uh, the other thing that's a little bit obvious, maybe, but worth uh, saying explicitly, is that you know the expressiveness of programming languages is what sort of facilitates us making these very complicated high fidelity simulators. We have uh, 
Turing complete languages and we can really make them as, as complicated and as expressive as we would like them to uh, be. And that paired with modern computing allows us to generate, you know, this synthetic data. Um, and, so, and so that, uh, you know, pairs very nicely with machine learning, which is uh, typically, you know, quite hungry for, for data. Um, unfortunately, the problem with simulators is they're poorly suited for statistical inference. They might describe the data well, but uh, it's hard to uh, use them directly for doing inference. And I'll try to make that uh, more clear. Um, so in terms of notation, the way that I'm going to be thinking of it is that this arrow from uh, left to right here is, is the, essentially the simulator. It's making predictions. Um, and the output of the simulator looks like is, looks like the observed data that you might have, and I'm calling that X. Um, and then I'm thinking of the simulator as maybe having various knobs that you can turn, which might be they're they're related to some parameters. Um, uh, so for in the in the case of physics, they might have to do with like the mass of a particle, or in the case of a uh, uh, epidemics, it might have to do with how uh, virulent a disease is, or or something you know one of the fundamental constants of cosmology. Um, there may also be nuisance parameters, which are things that you don't necessarily care uh, about what their values are, but they influence the distribution of the data. So, for instance, uh, they might have to do with a calibration constant uh, of your of your detector or something like that, where if it's miscalibrated, the data will 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 change. You don't necessarily care about that calibration constant itself, but you need to take it uh, uh, take care of it when you're doing inference. Um, and so then the simulator, um, I like to think of it as really as a probability model. It's describing a distribution over the data uh, uh, given the parameters of interest and the nuisance parameters. And inside of the simulator, there will typically, you know, some simulators are deterministic and they look more like fluid flow or, you know, uh, differential equations. But many simulators are stochastic. They have randomness inside. Um, so in the process of simulating, uh, they're throwing lots of random numbers. There's all sorts of uh, randomness inside. And uh, and that randomness usually has some physical meaning associated to it. But it's not something that you're going to get to observe in your actual experiment. So I'm calling those latent variables, and I'm calling Z. Uh, and um, now what oftentimes what we want to do you know, in science, there's sort of two major directions. One is making predictions, and the other is once you've observed some data to make some inference, for instance, to ask if your hypothesis is consistent with the data. Um, and so when you observe the data X and you try to make inference about the parameters, that is a that inferential problem is often referred to as an inverse problem. And, uh, and that is uh, what's typically uh, uh, difficult with simulators. While you can generate in the forward mode, uh, the uh, uh, if you get some observed data of actually evaluating this uh, this probability or this likelihood is typically intractable, and I'll try to explain that a, a bit more. Um, sometimes people are actually in, interested in inferring not just the parameters of interest and the nuisance parameters, but the latent variables themselves. Um, I'll focus more on trying to infer the, these parameters theta, um, but but both are both are possible, and I'll t I'll touch on both. Now, the thing that's got me kind of really excited uh, and focusing, you know, as much as I do on machine learning these days is that uh, is sort of in, in this slide. So, um, you know, first, many areas of science have these simulations that are based on some very well motivated mechanistic model. Uh, but the problem is that the aggregate effect of all the interactions between these low level components typically leads to an intractable inverse problem. And, and that's, you know, those are very important types of problems you'd like to be able to solve. And the fact that they're intractable is like a bottleneck to making scientific progress. Um, but the developments in machine learning have the potential to effectively bridge what I call the microscopic macroscopic divide uh, uh, and help in, in uh, these inverse problems. Um, so they can provide some sort of effective statistical model of the macroscopic emergent phenomena that you see in the, in the observed data X that are still tied back to the low level microscopic reductionist model, uh, which is this kind of mechanistic model for what's going on, uh, where you understand what these parameters mean. And making that connection between this emergent behavior and the kind of low level reductionist picture is, uh, you know, typically, you know, when you make that connection, it's a very big advance in science. And if you can start to automate that or, or, or further that with machine learning, I think that's very, uh, very important. And, uh, and that's what's got me sort of so excited recently. Um, so let me give an example. Um, if I talk about particle physics, uh, this equation on the top right is what's called the Lagrangian for the standard model of particle physics. It really describes all the 
you know, all the quarks and, and fundamental particles and how they interact and the fundamental forces and, as you know, basically test every, past every test that we've thrown at it in the last several decades. Um, you can, if you're a graduate student in, in physics, you would learn how to read these equations and turn them into these Feynman diagrams, this sort of picture of some particles colliding and other particles being produced and decaying and more particles decaying. Um, and this little picture describes, uh, uh, in this case, a 16 dimensional joint distribution over the energies and momenta of these outgoing particles. And this is something you can actually do with a pencil and paper, uh, you know, if you, if you study uh, particle physics. Um, but this is not the end of the story. A lot of times this is what we, we, we sort of show to, to illustrate our understanding, but uh, the, the simulator has many more stages because some of these uh, red lines involve particles like quarks, and those particles tend to radiate more particles. So that's what these blue you know, uh, curly lines are, is the radiation of additional particles. Um, and we know the physics of that, uh, what's going on there, but this is at, at the level that you can't write it down with a pencil and paper anymore. You really need to put it on a computer to simulate. Um, and uh, the number of, for instance, the number of these branches is, is variable. You don't know how many times it's going to branch. Um, and then there's another stage of, of, of uh, uh, in the simulation that happens where it's actually in a regime where we can't really calculate anymore and we actually have to go measure some of these things in other experiments. And then we essentially have tabulated uh, numbers uh, that go into our simulations. So the, gr the light green and the dark green involve phenomena that are essentially measured somewhere else and then uh, kind of grafted onto our prediction. So you see the, the prediction has you know, multiple stages to it. And at this level, this is still all happening essentially you know, within the nucleus of an atom. This is a very short uh, range uh, phenomena that's happening. But then the dark green particles come flying out into our enormous detectors at the Large Hadron Collider. And at that point, we're tracing particles through magnetic fields and tracking how they ionize matter in our detector. Um, and so the, the simulation is you know, very multi-scale. It's very computationally intensive. There are sort of hundreds of millions of uh, random latent variables for simulating just one collision at the Large Hadron Collider. And the way that random sampling is happening uh, we usually refer to as Monte Carlo, because if you think of it symbolically, what's happening is we're using a Monte Carlo integration over all the microphysics that's happening. And uh, and this in the, you know, the, for instance, the detector simulation conceptually is describing the probability of the detector response given the incoming particles. If I shot the same incoming particles into the detector second time and simulated with a different random number seed, I would get a different detector response. So it's really describing this probabilistic object, but I don't have like an equation for that probability. What I have instead is some code and this enormous Monte Carlo integration. And as a, as a consequence, the evaluation of the likelihood for the observation is, is intractable. It would involve doing this, you know, 100 million dimensional uh, integral if I wanted to try to actually evaluate the, the likelihood. So that's not gonna happen. Um, so this motivates a new class of algorithms so it's for what's called likelihood-free inference, uh, which only requires the ability to sample or generate samples from the simulator in the forward mode. Sometimes I, I prefer to use the term simulation-based inference instead of likelihood-free inference, but uh, they're sort of uh, in a synonymous with each other. Um, now, this is a common theme in many different areas of, of physics and has been going on for a while. This is a, a workshop that was held in 2014 uh, talking about uh, likelihood-free methods as a class of computational statistical approaches for intractable likelihoods. Uh, it's an important uh, tool uh, for many different areas of science, including systems biology, um, uh, computational neuroscience, uh, healthcare, particle physics, etc. cetera. Um, and, and, uh, and one of the main tools that has been used you know, traditionally in this is what's called approximate Bayesian computation. And I'm not gonna go through it in detail, but the, the heart of it is that you would sample some parameter theta from like, for instance, a prior over your, your parameters that you're interested in. You would simulate, you'd run your simulator to get some simulated data D prime. Um, and then you would try to compare the simulated data to the observed data. Typically you can't do that in its raw form. Uh, so you instead calculate some summary statistics, which try to summarize the data in some, some relevant quantity, which is called S here. And then you and then you compare the distance between S and S prime. And if that distance is uh, less than some threshold, then you, you uh, accept that value of theta and you do this many times and that ends up building up a posterior distribution for theta. Uh, but but what, is, what do I mean by distance? That's a bit uh, ad hoc. Uh, 
And where does this, you know, what's this threshold uh, epsilon uh, that will affect the, the quality of inference? So this is a kind of traditional technique, but it, it has some shortcomings. Uh, the, the presence of the summary statistics the, and the, this distance measure and things are all uh, sort of not, not uh, sort of the, you know, they're artifacts that you would not like to avoid. Um, at the Large Hadron Collider, we do something very similar where we run the simulator many, many times. Excuse me. The, the simulated data is very high dimensional. And so we reduce it into some summary statistics. So for instance, for the discovery of the Higgs boson, we had just a single summary statistic uh, for, uh, that, would, that uh, you know, was good for looking for the Higgs boson. And engineering that summary is something that you know, requires a very skilled uh, scientist to try to do. Um, and then we just approximate uh, the distribution of that summary statistic with a histogram, so just univariate density estimation. Um, and then we use that histogram as a proxy for the likelihood function. Um, so that's how, it, like, we have done it uh, traditionally in particle physics. The problem with this is it doesn't scale if the data or the summary is high dimensional. You can't make histograms in high dimensions uh, uh, effectively. And then this approximate Bayesian computation algorithm, also the, this distance measure in high dimen dimension starts to not work very well. Um, now, the discovery of the Higgs was in 2012, and the same month as the discovery of the Higgs was also the kind of, uh, you know, breakthrough in deep learning with uh, deep convolutional neural networks and ImageNet and all of these things. So the last several years, I've been thinking a lot about how can we use machine learning to try to uh, improve uh, simulation-based inference, and can we use machine learning to try to, like, get rid of, you know, address some of the shortcomings. Um, and this has been a kind of hot topic uh, in, uh, in, in machine learning as well, because it's very closely related to uh, other uh, types of implicit models. These are also models with uh, intractable likelihood. For instance, generative adversarial networks or GANs, which you see generating images, um, they have an intractable uh, likelihood. And it also is closely related to topics like variational inference. Uh, and and uh, and and uh, and normalizing flows and these kinds of things that have become increasingly popular. So this was a workshop in 2017 where you're starting to see this kind of connection. Um, and just uh, this year, we published a paper which is uh, we call the Frontiers of Simulation-Based Inference, which uh, looks at how a few different forces are basically pushing uh, uh, the the frontier of what we could do with traditional based methods, like I, I showed with ABC and what particle physicists do. Um, and so one, one of the axes is machine learning, uh, another axis is uh, active learning, and then what I'll call in integration and augmentation, which I'll touch on briefly. And what these are allowing us to do is, is work with either higher dimensional data, um, so higher uh, dimensional versions of X, or to be able to be more efficient, which allows us to work with either more expensive simulators or higher dimensional parameters that we're trying to infer. Um, and, uh, and the way that I think of the kind of landscape of different approaches to simulation-based inference is, is roughly two classes. One, where you try to use the simulator directly, uh, but you need to come up with some way of using it efficiently. So that was, for instance, approximate Bayesian computation. And there's also a technique called probabilistic programming, which I'll say a word about. And then there are other approaches where you try to learn the simulator, and that's what, what, where deep learning comes in. Uh, uh, and uh, so that includes things like, you know, GANs and variational autoencoders, uh, this likelihood ratio trick, which I'll go into a little bit, and normalizing flows and such. So if I talk about the, the left class for a little bit, uh, in that review paper, we, we, came, we sort of prepared a bunch of these like flow charts to describe, you know, all the, these different uh, approaches. They all basically involve the simulator. That's the yellow box in the middle. Uh, they all involve data. That's the blue, you know, box on the right. Uh, you know, many of them in, are Bayesian approaches, so they involve a prior at the, at the beginning, and then some sort of comparison between the data. So the approaches on the top are the ones where you're sort of using uh, the, the simulator directly. So I'm not going to, you know, go through all these flow charts. Um, and the ones on the bottom are the approaches where you tend to use uh, machine learning to come up with some sort of surrogate uh, that describes or approximates the simulator. Um, some of the approaches on the bottom that use machine learning use unsupervised learning. So you just generate samples from the simulator, and then you, you try to do something like density estimation, which is an unsupervised task. And other approaches actually uh, are, are cast in a more supervised learning setting, and which is important because you know, there have been a lot, of, uh, a lot of great successes in machine learning come in the supervised uh, setting. Um, and then the other point that I'll try to highlight a little bit is that sometimes you can augment the simulator. So the output is not just normal uh, sim uh, samples, but you're doing something uh, uh, more interesting with the simulator itself. 
Um, so the first approach that I'm going to describe is this uh, probabilistic programming approach at the top right. And so I'll go through that. Um, and so here, you see a little animation on the right. And what the, there's three animations. Hopefully, they're playing OK. Um, and what these are are examples from running the code on the left uh, three times. And the code on the left, you don't need to read it. But what it's doing is it's just randomly sampling a number of bumpers. Um, I'm going to go back and play that again. Um, it's randomly sampling some number of bumpers, those little green lines, and it's placing them randomly in the space. And then it's dropping some balls and running a physics engine. And so then it just simulates what would happen. And the balls bounce around. And th so these are three examples, three draws from a prior distribution over executions of this program. Um, but I might want to be, I might want to ask about a posterior distribution. Like for instance, what do the the execution of this program look like when 20% of the balls land up in that bin all the way on the right. So I would like, for instance, these balls to end up over here. Um, that's you know pretty unlikely that that's going to happen. And so what probabilistic programming does is it tries to you know bias or force the simulator to produce a certain outcome so that you can condition on that outcome. And you, here you see this last gratifying ball fall into the bin there. And so probabilistic programming is allowing you to say, you know, run the simulator, but give me this particular output. And if you can do that, then you can start to do Bayesian inference uh, in a much more uh, efficient way. Um, so uh, I'm not going to go into all the details of, of you know, the different approaches for probabilistic programming. Uh, but one of the, you know, up until now, most of that was done with sort of specialized uh, languages that computer scientists and statisticians developed for, for exploring that and doing research. Uh, but now what we've started to do is use it for real world scientific simulators. So, and the idea here is that you're going to hijack the random number generators. So this uh, black box down here is a real C++ physics simulator that we use at the Large Drunk Collider. We, we did some small changes to the code to be able to uh, hijack the random number generators. And then we have a separate program that's in Python, uh, which is steering the simulator. Um, and uh, and that uh, through and this uses a sort of uh, protocol to be able to talk uh, back and forth, um, and we were able to essentially do an important form of important sampling, uh, sorry, a fancy form of important sampling to steer the simulator to give us a desired output. And so you see at the bottom here's some observation that we get out of our simulator, and then we can force the simulator to give us something like that. Now, when we did this, it required running on you know supercomputers. Uh, and it was a pretty heavy task, um, but uh, but we were able to do it. And that was actually uh, nominated for a, a Best Paper Award at Supercomputing 2019 and involved training with, you know, 30,000 CPU cores uh, and, uh, and a very, very large uh, uh, neural network was used for, for the important sampling. So that is pretty cool, but it's an example of like machine learning uh, connected to the simulators. And now that same uh, sort of setup that we used for particle physics is now being used for epidemiology and population genetics and and uh, different types of public health uh, 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 simulations, which is uh, nice to see. And so here are just a few examples that are using this uh, same kind of uh, tooling uh, to be able to study, you know, epidemiology and COVID and things like that. Okay, so the next uh, approach, the set of approach I'd like to describe, have to do with these ones where you use machine learning. Uh, to try to approximate the simulator. Um, again, there are a few different approaches here. And so for time, I'm just going to focus on uh, these two on the right. Um, and, I, and, uh, uh, and so we'll, we'll be using the simulator and then trying to approximate some sort of likelihood for, for inference later on. This is a, maybe a more friendly uh, uh, schematic of the same idea. Um, here's the simulator. Uh, it takes in some parameters theta. Inside the simulator, it has some latent variable z and it outputs some synthetic observations x. And what we're going to do is train a neural network that takes in not only the data x, but also the values of the parameter theta. And that the goal of the neural network is to try to approximate a likelihood or a likelihood ratio. Um, and so if you can do that uh, after training it, then if you get, come with new data, you just plug in you know, new data into the x slot. And then when you go to do inference, you know you put in a value of theta that you're interested in testing, and then you can you can make you know your typical you know statistical inference uh, uh, you know uh, plots that you would like on the far right. So it has this kind of two stage process: with first training the neural network, and then secondly inference. Uh, and so because of that, it's referred to as an amortized approach because you have you pay some upfront costs to train it, but then inference is fast. Um, so one of the approaches here it was to use a uh, a classifier uh, 
uh, to tr try to learn a likelihood ratio. So the way that it works is just a simple binary classifier, like you have red dots and blue dots, and you'd like to try to uh, tell the difference between them. Uh, if you if they overlap, you can't separate them exactly. Um, and what's what's known is that the you know the uh, optimal way of separating these classes, if you knew the likelihood function, would be a likelihood ratio test. This is the Nyman Pearson lemma. Uh, but from a machine learning point of view, you can set up a loss function, which symbolically looks like an expectation. And here I'm imagining labeling the red points uh, as, as zero and the blue points as one. And I would like to the the output of my neural network S to you know label them appropriately. And in this example, I'm using a squared loss. So if S is different than the target, that you get you get a penalty. And this intractable integral can be approximated just with samples. So that this works in this likelihood free setting. Um, you use uh, supervised learning, and the uh, a neural network in this binary classification with this loss function will tend to approximate this particular quantity right here. This is the Bayes optimal classifier. And this function is one to one with the likelihood ratio, which is the optimal uh, point thing from the point of view of the the like the Nyman Pearson lemma. So um, so here's a way where you can use supervised learning to learn uh, you know some proxy for the thing that you want. Uh, this is in the binary setting where I just have two classes, but you can elevate that or you know generalize it to a situation where instead of having two hypotheses h zero and h one like the red dots and the blue dots, you have a parameterized setup. Um, where uh, you're comparing uh, two different points in your parameter space. So you have the distribution at some point theta naught and the distribution at some point theta one, and you do the same trick, but now your neural network takes in not only the data, but also the two values of the parameters that you would like to compare. And the theta one doesn't have to be another point in the parameter space. It could just be some other reference uh, that you would like to compare against. Um, and that allows you to learn likelihood ratios. Um, and so that now we've kind of completed this uh, pipeline so you can do inference later on. Um, so we realized later that we can extract more information from the simulator uh, uh, to, uh, to try to make this more efficient. So instead of just having observations X coming out of the simulator, we can have this augmented data, uh, which we can extract from the simulator to uh, use in the loss functions, uh, which uh, it makes it more sample efficient for training. Um, and the, here's an example of a simulator where you, know, you see the balls bouncing around. Uh, imagine the, the path through the, this uh, you know, lattice of nails is the latent variable, and X is the, uh, the observation is where you land, which bin you land in. Um, so the, the intuitively, the idea is that you know, this distribution at the bottom is intractable, uh, but if I thought about, uh, if I conditioned on the particular path that uh, one of these balls took through the simulator, then I can ask some other questions. I can ask about the, the likelihood conditioned on that latent trajectory. Um, and that allows us to calculate things like uh, uh, likelihood ratios or the score, which is just the gradient of the log likelihood ratio with respect to the parameter. And what makes this tractable is because you're conditioning also on the latent path. So that, that oftentimes is tractable and something you can extract from the simulator uh, because it doesn't involve doing this really big uh, integral. Um, and then you can use that data um, in a supervised setting um, and basically, just as we had supervised setting before with the labels of just being zero and one, so that's like kind of vertical axis, this is what the training data looked like before. Now the training data looks like this much more continuous valued quantity where you have not only points, but also like tangent information. And when you put it all together, this is, uh, this is much richer training data and it makes it much easier to learn. And what we've seen is that if we look at the estimation error of the likelihood ratio, that's the vertical axis in this plot, versus the number of training examples we need, instead of using something like 10 million training samples, we can uh, do sort of equivalently well with something more like 10,000 training samples. So we had sort of three order uh, reduction in, in the amount of training data needed for the same quality of inference. Um, and now I'll show some examples of using that in practice. Um, so one of them is at the is a, you know, is particle physics uh, setting. Um, I'm not gonna go through the, you know, the particle physics, but here's one of these Feynman diagrams. Um, and uh, the, the, these particles on the right are, are you know, flying into my detector. So I'm gonna, going to observe something related to these. Um, and the, the parameters theta uh, are going to influence the interaction at these two red points. And I can parameterize that uh, with just two numbers. So I just have two coefficients, which are these red boxes here. And as I change those two coefficients, it's gonna change uh, the, you know, the distribution and the and parameterize the mechanistic model that way. And I, I'm imagining a situation where I have 
40, 42 dimensional data. So it's not super high dimensional, but it's like, you know, it's not, it's pretty high dimensional. And the data lives on a, actually a 16 dimensional manifold in this 42 dimensional space uh, because of things like energy and momentum conservation and stuff like that. Um, now, uh, in the setting, we, we first we considered a case where we could still actually evaluate the true likelihood ratio to kind of validate these approaches. And we see that the machine learning approach can in, indeed learn the likelihood ratio uh, very accurately. So that's what you see in this uh, diagonal. It sits, sits you know, very accurately. And this plot on the right is comparing uh, this is the log likelihood as a function of the parameters. And this, the, the sharper this log likelihood, the more precise my measurement is. Um, and so the traditional approaches were this yed dot, yellow dotted line and the red uh, dashed line is what we get by using the machine learning approaches. So you see it is, is more uh, a more precise measurement. And visually this isn't so striking maybe, but this corresponds, I mean, this corresponds to uh, sort of doubling, you know, 90% more data at the LHC, uh, which is, uh, you know, which would be a very expensive proposition if you actually wanted to run the LHC for twice as long. And this is one of the flagship measurements uh, at the Large Hadron Collider around the Higgs. So being able to uh, improve the sensitivity this much is really like, is a pretty, pretty big deal. Um, here's another example uh, of, uh, of uh, inference for the Higgs using these techniques. Um, this is a two dimensional parameter space. The red dashed line here is like the traditional approach that's being used at the, at the LHC. And with these machine learning based approaches, we can move to this much more precise measurement. Uh, so the, you know, the tighter this error ellipse, that means the more precise the measurement is. And this is again, equivalent to increasing the LHC data by like several factors in this case. So that's uh, again, like very, very promising. Um, another example I'll go through uh, very quickly has to do with dark matter. Um, here you see a galaxy and the galaxy is surrounded by a, a halo of dark matter. And these little blue dots are little clumps of dark matter. Uh, the, it's, the dark matter is not perfectly smooth, it's clumpy. And uh, if what you would like to know in this case is the sort of the distribution of these, what are called subhalos, the, uh, the mass distribution of these subhalos. So this horizontal axis is mass, and the, this is like the number density of those uh, subhalos. And the distribution of those subhalos is sensitive to the mass of the dark matter. So uh, the, we don't know what the dark matter particle is, but if we could uh, infer its mass, that would be very important. Um, the problem is that we don't get to observe these dark matter halos because it's, you know, it's dark matter. So, uh, but you can get at it indirectly uh, by using gravitational lensing where a background galaxy's light is bent by some foreground galaxy that has, you know, dark matter and dark matter halos around it. And that will uh, lead to some sort of uh, uh, image, like maybe you've seen one of these before of a, of a image of a galaxy that's been lensed because of the curvature of space and time. And the presence of these dark matter subhalos will imprint themselves as small deviations in this image. And that's what you would like to like look for. Um, and so you're gonna, there are surveys that are coming up that are gonna be producing a lot of these images. Um, and, uh, and so I'll go through this quickly, but we, we built a simulator uh, that kind of includes all of the uh, ingredients and produces these images. Uh, and we use these kinds of tricks to come up with a likelihood ratio estimator. Um, and uh, the, that simulator includes basically you know, all of the important physics uh, that, you know, uh, of, of the lensing and it includes, uh, you know, the, how the dark matter subhalos are laid out, a detector model, uh, Poisson fluctuations of photons hitting the detector, all these kinds of things. And what that allows us to do is then build a pipeline so that as images come in, uh, we can quickly uh, try to infer these are the two parameters that describe uh, that, uh, that uh, the distribution of dark matter and you see the posterior concentrating around the true point that was used for this this mock uh, you know synthetic data, um, so so this is uh, another example of like these uh, approaches being used in the physical sciences. So I see I've gone a little bit slower than I intended to, and I'm at uh, kind of thirty minutes. So I'm going to use like just a couple minutes to uh, quickly uh, uh, wrap up and leave the rest of the time for questions. Um, so as much as I love these uh, methods, I think it is important to kind of point out you know their weak points. Uh, so the first thing to say is that, you know, this is true of any approach, uh, you know, inference is always done within the context of a model. And if that model is misspecified, of course, it will affect your inference and you might get, you know, wrong answers. So in this case that I'm talking about, the model is the simulator itself uh, or the surrogate that's approximating the simulator. And so on one hand, you know, usually the simulators include more effects and so they're high fidelity. And so that might be better than some approach where you, uh, you know, you don't use the simulator. Uh, on the other hand, the simulator uh, 
because it's so detailed, offers more chances for some method to kind of grab onto something that's poorly modeled. So we need to be careful about that. Um, humans are pretty good, actually, at designing robust summary statistics that are not sensitive to these mismodeling uh, features in the data, while with machine learning, you have to be more careful. Uh, however, there are a number of approaches that are being uh, developed uh, to try to come up with machine learning uh, techniques that don't kind of uh, pay attention to these uh, effects that are not very well modeled. Um, so I don't think that that's like a, you know, a, a super severe problem, but it is something that we need to worry about. Um, the other thing that I is that, you know, what I talked about here was really just stopping with inference. Um, I had a few slides to describe kind of continuing this into this a broader scientific method where after doing inference with a particular experiment, we try to optimize and design the next experiment and then start to kind of complete the scientific loop. Um, I prototyped this in some notebook uh, you know, a few years ago that used these kind of simulation-based inference approaches, uh, sequ sequential experimental design with active learning and reusable workflows and things. And there's a link at the top right. Um, and I sort of tweeted about this in 2017, uh, Danilo Rosende, who you may know from VAEs and normalizing flows and things, um, uh, you know, thought it was pretty cool because you sort of see the scientific method and, you know, all enclosed in some algorithm. Uh, but it's also important to remember that this is, you know, and this is a case where the space of experimental configurations that I provided the algorithm was already very fixed. So you kind of knew what kind of experiments you could do. Um, and also the simulator was well specified and I didn't have to do hypothesis generation. So I think if you step, take a step way back and think about the scientific method more broadly, machine learning and all these things I'm talking about are doing a great job, but they're doing a you know, relatively narrow uh, you know, part of the job of the broader scientific method. So thinking about how you develop new hypotheses and how you think about what experiments to go do to test those hypotheses, um, that is still, you know, we're still some ways away from being able to do that, but I think that's where things are going and is an exciting direction. Um, and, and in terms of getting there, I think part of the, the trick is going to be having the machine learning models uh, sort of uh, be interpretable in some sense, but interpretable mainly in, uh, in, the, in, the in the following sense that they have uh, some inductive bias that's related to the underlying causal mechanism that you, that you, for instance, you see in the simulator. So a lot of my work in recent years has been trying to develop machine learning approaches where the uh, the architectures and the inductive bias are, are related or motivated by the underlying causal mechanism that you would see in the simulator. Um, and I think once you start to grab those causal components, uh, then you it will you know be easier to try to uh, come up with ways of uh, of testing the models and and uh, you know hypothesis generation and being able to reuse and and compose and remix the different kind of ingredients that you've learned uh, in some set in some setting. Um, and with that, I'll just conclude uh, that uh, I think that you know machine learning is very exciting. One of the ways that I'm you know, particularly excited about it for the sciences is sort of figuring out how to get more out of our simulators. Uh, this ability to kind of connect the macroscopic you know observations to the mechanistic model, I think, is very exciting. Uh, harnessing the full potential of that is is not just a job of machine learning. It also involves uh, working with the simulators themselves and and. Uh, augmenting them to give them, you know, special powers that they didn't have before. Um, and then I think, uh, you know, looking forward uh, about how we can incorporate our, our physical understanding, our scientific understanding in the machine learning models uh, is going to be very important for like trying to move forward and using machine learning for the scientific method. And uh, with that, I'll end and we still have 10 minutes for questions. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kyle, for this very nice talk. I think this was really interesting, at least from my point of view. I I can see what you outlined. This approach is um, not only something that might work in physics, but it might also work in many other disciplines because it's a very like um, a very um, powerful approach to use simulations to um, then verify models and have sort of this loop of of um, trying to infer what is really the ground truth. So now sure. we would like to go to the question session. And um, for the audience out there, um, there's this tool to ask a question. And if you want, um, type your question in this tool. It's at the bottom of the right, uh, bottom right of your screen. Um, there are already a couple of questions in there, but while I'm asking some of them, you can also type in more questions. Okay, so here's one question um, that's been asked by Konstantin Jenin. Um, which is whether the main, I think it, it refers to the section about the um, inference of this likelihood ratio um, part. So he asks, um, you can generate simulations by a physical model. You can, sorry, I got interrupted. You can generate simulations by a physical model. 
or try to use black box machine learning? Are there examples where the machine learning approach comes close to the model-based approach and how to evaluate it? Um, yeah, I'm trying to think. I mean, in the machine, in the black box, let's see. I'm not sure I 100% understand the question in terms of the comparing them because uh, in, a, in, the, in this, we're still, we're using a simulator. Let me go full screen again. Um, we're using a simulator to essentially generate the training data. And then we use neural networks to try to learn a likelihood ratio. Um, and that, um, and that, in that sense, the neural network, I haven't really said anything about how it is. So you could imagine this is kind of, has a black box component to it, uh, but that black box is then trying to learn uh, the simulator. If you, if you threw away the simulator and you just wanted to, you had a neural network to try to uh, uh, work with say like just raw data, the problem is you wouldn't know how to connect it to the parameters theta at all, right? Like you would just have data from some source and, and theta is, it doesn't really mean anything, you know? So the, so I think um, in this, this setting, what the, the part that's nice is that, um, you, you know, the, the way that theta is related to the parameters of my model, which are, you know, physically meaningful things that I'm trying to infer are related to the observation you know, it might be very, very complicated, but that's all kind of implicitly defined in the simulator. And I don't really need to know exactly, I don't need to know what's happening inside that's treated like a black box. And then I give it to a neural network to try to like then learn that relationship, at least probabilistically. Um, I don't know if I'm answering the question, but I, I, I feel that if you were to throw away the simulator at all, you wouldn't have any way to relate the data to the parameters of you know of your mechanistic model, and that's that's the real shortcoming of just kind of raw, you know, raw machine learning in that setting. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So the next question I want to ask is by Tino Cerning: um, <coughs> How much will the machine learning approaches suffer from an inexact simulator, like assuming too much linearity where the actual physics has non-linearities? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, so if the you know in that sense it, again the, the answer to that doesn't have too much to do with machine learning, right? If you imagine that you had a super powerful, uh, you know, ability to take the simulator and, and turn it into, you know, the reason that it's intractable uh, uh, to do inference with the simulator is because, mainly because these, uh, to get the likelihood involves doing this very large integration. But if you, you know, someone gave you a super powerful computer and you could do that integration, you would have the likelihood function and you would do inference with it. And the problem you would have would be that this, the simulator, if it's misspecified, if it doesn't have the right physics in it or the right you know, mechanistic model, then your inference will be wrong, right? And so that, that problem has really nothing to do with machine learning. It has to do with the fact that the simulator is misspecified. Um, and that's something that you know, you know, scientists and of all sorts, you know, we, we often refer to that as a systematic uncertainty. If the way that we're describing the phenomena is, you know, is not including some effects, uh, then we need to deal with that, right? So, so I think what I like about this this setting is that it's a place where scientists actually have a lot of experience. They know that their models have deficiencies, and they've come up with a lot of different uh, approaches. Some of them are heuristic, but uh, about how do you continue to make scientific progress even if your model, you know, you know, has some deficiencies. Mm -hmm. And so, in this case, the fact that there's machine learning involved makes it a little bit more complicated, but it's just going to inherit whatever deficiencies you have with the simulator. Um, but there now are approaches, uh, you know, or opportunities to try to maybe mix the two together, like use the simulator and use real data and try to use the this machine learning to, for instance, learn a residual on the simulator, which might then improve, uh, you know, like lessen the systematic uncertainty uh, or this kind of, uh, you know, epistemic uh, uncertainty that you have. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's uncertainty that you might have in your simulator, but you might also have like an inductive bias in your machine learning methods, right? So it could be that even if your model is very well specified, the, the machine learning algorithm in the end is going to have such a strong bias that in the in the end you can't really see or or you get the yeah. wrong out kind of outcome. Yeah, so I, maybe I misunderstood the question. I thought the question was referring to deficiencies in the no, simulator. No, it did, but I, I would, so this was essentially the second oh, yeah. question. Yeah. Yeah, no, but it's it's also true that your simulator could be, uh, you know, say essentially good, you know, a, a, you know, an accurate simulation of what's going on. Uh, but if when you in the machine learning stage, you of course need the machine learning the the neural network model to have enough expressive power to actually describe it. Um, and so, uh, and or, or maybe it has enough expressive power, but maybe you don't have enough training data or. 
you know, any of a number of things. So, so the fact that you're using a surrogate definitely makes it a little bit more complicated. Um, but maybe I'll say one thing before moving on is that uh, in the traditional approaches that were used, for instance, like in the Higgs discovery, if I go back to this uh, at the very beginning, um, the, the uh, this histogram is playing the same role as the neural network surrogate. It is approximating the likelihood. So for instance, if if you only run the simulator a few times, you know, your histogram is going to have a lot of statistical fluctuations in it. Um, and so that those same same kinds of issues happen in a, in a different sort of uh, manifestation, even in, in like more traditional approaches, but it's there. And I think this idea of how do you, you know, come up with a, a nice statistical formalism and statistical theory about uh, understanding the quality of inference in the simulation based setting where you have uh, some the surrogate also has its own approximation error in addition to the simulator itself maybe being misspecified is really interesting and very rich area for research. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much, Kyle. I think our time is over now. Um, I'd like to thank you very, very much for joining us um, from so far away, <laughs> which oh, is yeah, one no, of the good pleasure. aspects of, of the COVID crisis that by now we can have all these conferences online, <laughs> which is really one right. of the good outcomes of all of it. So thanks a lot for joining. And now I'd like to ask our tech team to switch to the next presentation. Thanks a lot, Kyle, and goodbye. Great. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. <laughs> I don't know if I need to do anything here. <laughs> I think we might just have to wait.